All right, let's get started. I don't, I don't think my mic is working. Is this, is this mic work? Oh, it's on, but it's super quiet. Huh. Okay, hi. How's it going? Good to see you guys. Uh, I'm going to assume that your applause is thanks for the high quality of the midterm exam that you took last week, right? No? <laughs> oh, no, maybe, maybe something else. Uh, no, but I'm sure you know I, I've been out for a while. Uh, I had something important I had to take care of. Um, it's kind of fitting to me that this, I guess, is parents' weekend, right? Got a couple of got a couple of parents in the house. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome to CS 106B. I want to apologize to any parents in the room. I'm the reason your kid isn't responding to your calls and texts because they're working on my brutally hard homework assignments. That's my fault. I apologize for that. But yeah, it's fitting that this is parents' weekend because. Uh, you know, I've just become a parent, and uh, this is my little baby Eve right here. It's, I mean, I, I told myself I wasn't going to spend this whole lecture just like talking about baby stuff. Um, it's, it's really moving, really overwhelming. Um, she's awesome. She's healthy. She's doing great. Uh, I did not bring her in today. <laughs> She's like five days old. I'm, I'm not allowed to bring her to college campus yet. Uh, that would be negligence on my part. Um, it's, it's been really a blast, a really uh, roller coaster. Like, yeah, she, uh, my wife went into labor literally the day of the midterm. So we were like making copies and stuff, and it's like, oops, gotta go. <laughs> uh, so I've been kind of uh, whipped up into that ever since. And uh, you know, actually, Amy have been doing a great job. Like taking care of everything for the last week or so while I've been gone. Uh, I'm still going to be on kind of a reduced schedule for the rest of the quarter because i got some important work to do at home, mostly involving fecal matter. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some of the lectures each week. I'll probably be here every Friday. I may be in another day each week. Uh, but actually, any of you are going to continue to help me figure things out as we finish out the course. But um, I thought, you know, usually I reward you for coming to class by showing you pictures of my puppies and my animals. I thought maybe this time I could show you a couple of baby pictures. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. So, wait, where is she? Here's some pictures of Eve. Here's me watching basketball while she's being born. <laughs> my wife was really mad at me because I was watching the three-point all-star shootout while she was pushing. Um, here she is in her little burrito wrap-up thing. It's actually not that hard because all you do is you, it's called swaddling them. You wrap them up and they like can't move their arms and legs and then they're pretty easy to keep track of after that. They just can't really move anywhere. You just turn them into a little baby burrito and then you can just kind of walk away after that. It's pretty easy. Um, so here she is. Here's us still at the hospital. She's the best. I can't tell if she looks more like me or like my wife. Uh, she might have got my schnoz. Sorry, honey. I don't know. <laughs> uh, here, this is, oh, I already showed you this one. This, I think it's my favorite picture. It just melts your heart when you stick your little hand over and they grab your, your hand with their little fingers and stuff. It's, it just melts you. I, I'm not a sentimental type. I'm not even that into babies. But somehow when your baby does that, it's just like your whole world is different after that. Um, <laughs> I think this is after I told her a joke or a pun or something. Um, my favorite moment of, of all, I think, uh, was when we got to bring her home and I got to introduce her to our animals. We got three dogs and two cats. And I was kind of scared, like, are these dogs going to be barking at her? Are they going to bite her? What's going to happen? Are they going to jump all over her, scratch her? They were super cool. I don't know, animals just have instincts or something. They just see this little baby and like, I got these rambunctious dogs. They run and jump. They basically do loop-de-loops on the ceiling. They're so energetic. But somehow when I hold this baby out in front of them, they just get it. They just know. They kind of just like chilled out and they carefully sniffed her and they were quiet and they were gentle. It was really nice. Here's Eve with my French bulldog, Abby. Melts my heart. They just sniffed her real gentle, you know. Here's her with uh, my, my other dog, Barney, my wife cautiously guarding her. <laughs> what are you looking at, Barney? What are you doing? But he was really cool. Um, here's Eve with our cats. The two kitties were really curious about her. Uh, where's the other cat picture? Uh, oops. 
There's one cat picture. There's the other. Yeah, the kitties. The kitties don't really know what to make of her. I think. I think the dogs are like trying to protect her, and the cats are like, "Does this mean I get less attention now?" <laughs> you know, there's a difference between dogs and cats here. Uh, what else? Here's here's even her mommy taking a little nap. I tell you, you know, you have a baby with somebody. It really, it really shows you something about your partner. Like I don't know, some of you guys are probably dating, probably in relationships right now. And uh, I, I feel really lucky. Like, I found a partner who's really worth spending my life with. And uh, you really see that when you have a baby. You know, like, you see them at their best and at their worst. You see them when they're in excruciating pain and when they've had 45 minutes of sleep in the last two days combined. And you just really, it's a real test, you know, and it really shows you what kind of person you chose to spend your time with. And uh, my wife's been amazing, and it just really brought us together. You know, it's really special. Um, <laughs> And she makes more money than I do. What's not to like? Um, and then somebody sent me this picture. I kept, I kept talking about how my baby was like a burrito, and somebody sent me this. <laughs> That's not a picture of Eve. That's Chipotle, Chipotle Eve, I think. Um, okay, I'm going to move on and actually talk about other stuff. But, uh, you know, thanks for bearing with me. I know this quarter, like, it's going to be a little weird the last couple of weeks. I'm a little harder to reach. I'm still on email, I'm still on Piazza. I'll be here at least every Friday. Uh, I'll try to make it more clear how you can reach me and get a hold of me. And in the meantime, you know, Amy and Ashley are gonna help, help us kind of uh, get things done and finish out the quarter. I wanted to briefly talk about the, um, the midterm and kind of how things are going in, in the class. Um, I know that, uh, I, mean, I think Ashley maybe talked a little bit about this on Wednesday, but uh, you know, we graded the midterms. You should have your grade, you should be able to look it up by now. And I also posted some information about how you're doing in the class in general. And, uh, you know, some people don't like how they're doing or they don't like the, the numbers that are, that are on the screen. And I guess what I would say is that uh, you still have a lot of opportunities to change that, to, to you know, perform well on homework five, six, seven, do well on the final exam, do well on your section participation. You have a whole bunch of points left to earn. If you want to see your grade percentages go up, if you have a different goal in mind, uh, I would say don't, don't give up on that. There's still a lot of quarter left. A lot of our points get like mushed here into the end of the quarter. So, um, you know, I would just generally say that, uh, you know, keep, keep doing what you're doing. And also keep in mind that, uh, you know, if you see some kind of percentage on the web page about how you're doing, remember that I fit your scores to a curve. And like about half of you are going to get A's and about 30% of you are going to get B's. You know, a lot of you are going to get a mark that's higher than you might be afraid that it would be. So, you know, don't, don't give up and just keep on doing what you're doing. Oh, and uh, one last thing before I start to, like, teach you new stuff. I'm going to teach you some stuff today, I promise. Uh, I was feeling good. I think when, you, when you're a parent, you get kind of loopy. You get kind of a combination of sleep deprivation and hormones and adrenaline. So I was kind of in a good mood today. So I decided I'm going to give everyone an extra Lakin. delivered that wrong. I should have been like, you get a late day, and you get a late day, and you get a late day. Um, so yeah, there you go. I figure I had to take a couple of late days, so I should let you have a late day too. So anyway, okay, having said all that, uh, I would like to teach you some stuff now. So uh, let me jump to, so where, where we are in the class right now is that we've just finished learning about binary trees. So I hope that you're seeing, you know, the context here. Binary trees are a mixture of uh, pointers and recursion, and that helped us learn more about how you can implement collections like sets, maps, and also lexicon. And you know, we're kind of on this journey to learn all about the different collections in our in our data structure library and how they work, how they're implemented. So we're going to continue that today. We're going to learn, we'll start learning about a new type of a collection called a graph. And graphs are really powerful, really interesting, and so you know this will start today, and we'll do graphs all through most of next week as well. Okay, so here are my slides on graphs from chapter 18 of the textbook. Um, if you hear the word graph, you probably think of like a, a Cartesian plane with x and y and a line being drawn or something like that. That's not the way that I mean graph here. Uh, a graph is a data structure in computer science that contains vertexes and edges. So uh, we talk about a graph that consists of V and E. Edges are connections between two vertexes. Sometimes they call the vertexes nodes so that it's more like linked lists that have nodes. Uh, sometimes the uh, edges between them are called arcs. So you might hear that alternative terminology, but I'm going to say vertexes and edges. I think that's more common. 
And uh, yeah, an edge connects a pair of vertexes to each other. So here's a picture of a graph, A, B, C, D, and there are edges between some of the vertexes, right? There's a whole bunch of terms I'm going to tell you today about graphs. One term is that every vertex has a degree, which is a number of edges that touch it. So uh, A has a degree of 1, uh, B has a degree of 2, D has a degree of 2, C has a degree of 3 uh, in that picture up there in the top right corner, okay? So graphs are a really interesting data structure that you can use to solve a whole bunch of fascinating computer science problems. I'll show you some of those as we go along. Um, here are a couple quick examples. A social network, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Oh, by the way, if you want to see lots of baby pictures, I'm totally dumping them all on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to like add me, I'll be happy to show you all my baby pictures there. But um, a social network is often basically a graph of people connected to each other. The edge is when they're friends with each other or following each other, right? Um, also, you could do things like uh, maps, maps of airline flights, maps of roads, Google Maps, all that kind of stuff. The connection between different places you know, the edges are the roads or the flights, and the vertexes are the cities or the locations that you want to go to, right? So there's a lot of examples like this. Okay, so that's what a graph is. <clears throat> Here's some other examples of graphs. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but, um, you know, you could, you could think of a lot of things as being a graph, even if it doesn't seem like a graph to you at first. Like, for example, you could think about courses and prerequisites at a university as a graph. Like what, do you know what I mean? Like what would be a vertex and what would be an edge if you had a graph like that? Yes? The course you want to take would be like a node and all the edges would be in three lines that you need for that particular Yeah, a course is a node or vertex and an edge is like whether something's a prereq of something else. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can do this with chemistry, you can do it through solving a maze, there's all kinds of different examples. Links between web pages, the pages themselves are the vertexes, and if a page has a link to another page, that represents an edge. So you can think about like from this page, what other pages can I get to, stuff like that, right? So those are some examples where you'll use graphs. They're all over the place. I didn't list, there's a ton, ton, ton of examples of where you would use graphs. Like when you're laying out circuits, when you're building processors, there's all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so, if you were going to represent a maze, you know, we thought about mazes a little bit. Remember we wrote a recursive algorithm to escape out of a maze? Could you think of a maze as a graph? What would be the vertexes and what would be the edges? Parents, feel free to volunteer if you have an answer too. Yes? That's a pretty good way to think of it. Like you can superimpose kind of a grid on this, and then each little square that you can visit is like a vertex. And there's an edge between neighboring squares if you can pass from one to the other. And there isn't an edge if there's a wall blocking. So yeah, that's, that's a good answer. Uh, something like that. Those are the vertexes and the thick lines are the edges between them, something of that nature, right? Um, you could have Boggle be a graph. I know you don't think of it as one, you think of it as a grid. But it could be a graph. I have these multiple choice answers here. I mean, basically, the letter cubes themselves are vertexes, and then you have edges to the neighboring cubes. So, you know, a lot of graph algorithms involve looking at neighbors, and you guys have written algorithms like Game of Life and Boggle that involve looking at neighbors of a given thing. And so a lot of these neighbor algorithms are kind of basically graph algorithms. So, anyway, lots of things can be modeled as a graph if you want to. And you might say, well, wait, why do I care about that? I don't, I don't need Boggle to be a graph. I already solved Boggle. I used a grid. You know, I don't need a maze to be a graph. I solved that with uh, recursion. So I guess that raises a good question, right? Like, why would I want to think of these problems as being graph problems? What does that get me if I already have other ways of solving these problems? Well, the answer to that is that um, lots of smart people have studied graphs and have come up with algorithms for searching graphs, for for sorting graphs, processing graphs, looking for stuff in <coughs> graphs. And if you can take your problem and turn it into a graph problem, then there's probably some well-known existing algorithm to solve that problem, and then you have the answer to your problem. This is a really common trick in computer science, uh, reducing one problem into another one where the second one is, uh, has a known solution. That's a really common thing that we do. So that's why we would want to think of these other things as maybe as being graph problems, okay? 
Uh, a lot of times when we're talking about graphs, we want to think about paths. A path is a way to get from one place to another, one vertex to another. You could express a path as the vertexes to visit, or you could write it down as the set of edges to walk across. Either way, you can kind of get the same information. I guess the only exception to that would be if there were multiple edges that connected the same pair of vertexes. But I'm usually not going to have graphs like that in our examples today. So for example, if you want to find a path from vertex V to Z in that graph, you can take edge VH, or you could take vertexes VXZ. You know, those are both the same, the same path, basically, right? When you have a path, you sometimes are concerned with how long the path is, how many edges you have to walk across to, to get that path. Um, you know, lots of examples of this. Like if, if, the path, if the graph is airlines, airline flights, then the path length is what? Like if you say, I have a graph of all the airline flights today, and here's a path that has a length of three, what does that mean in the real world? Three stops, three connections, so you fly from New York to Chicago, Chicago to Denver, Denver to Seattle, whatever, something like that, right? So you might say, <laughs> do you have any paths with a shorter length? Do you have any paths with fewer hops? Uh, something like that. Um, anyway, yeah, that's a term we talk about, path length. There's also this notion of being a neighbor or being adjacent to another vertex. That just means there's a direct edge connecting you to that vertex. So W is a neighbor of U and X and Y, right? Okay, terminology. Um, there. So, uh, you know, a path doesn't have to be the shortest or best or whatever. Like, if I want to find a path from <coughs> U to V, I could just follow edge A. But it's totally also valid to go from U to W to X to Y to W to V or whatever. You could, you could bounce all around. There might be some reason you want a longer path or something. Maybe uh, you're exercising, you're running. When you're running, you don't always want the shortest path because you're probably going to go back where you started. So the shortest path would be like that, you know? <laughs> so you probably want to run a couple miles out of the way. Anyway, uh, you can go different ways to get to the same destination. Uh, so here's some more terms. A vertex is reachable from another vertex if there exists some path from the first to the other. So A can reach B if there's a path from A to B. So in the graphs I'm showing, like that one up there, Every vertex is reachable from every other. You just follow edges, you can get everywhere. But there's some graphs for which that isn't the case, like this one in the bottom right, the vertexes D and E are separated off from the other ones. Again, if you want real world examples, like there are flights that don't go to certain countries, or if you're doing pipes or electrical plugs or whatever, like there's some connected networks that don't reach other parts of other networks. There's all kinds of ways you can imagine this. Uh, friend circles, you know, your friends don't have anybody in common with their friends, so you have these little disconnected regions of a graph, right? Um, we have this term we call connected, which means every vertex can reach every other vertex. So the top right graph is connected, the bottom left one is connected, the bottom right one isn't. A complete graph is where literally every vertex has an edge that goes to every single other vertex. That's kind of rare. But there are some examples of that in, you know, in various data sets. So reachability and connectedness are important. Uh, you know, I gave examples like flights. I mean, connectedness is good because then you say, hey, no matter what city you're in, there's some kind of flight plan we can sell you that will get you to where you want to go. Or whatever, you're plugging in power lines for a city and you say, I need to make sure it's all connected because I want every house to get power, right? OK, so that's reachability. Um, there are certain paths that are called cycles. A cycle is where you end up at the same place where you started. It's not inherently a bad thing or a good thing. Sometimes you want to find algorithms or, or solutions that don't have cycles. So, um, you know, an example in that graph would be uh, V, X, W, V. Usually the rule that you follow is you can't traverse on the same edge twice in the same path. So, like, I guess trivially you could just say, U, V, U by following edge A twice. But we usually don't count that as a cycle because you had to take the same edge two times. A graph that doesn't have any cycles is called an acyclic graph. So that graph right there is cyclic. I can just prove it by showing you cycles, right? So um, can you tell me like some changes you could make to make this graph become acyclic? Like what would I have to modify to make it be an acyclic graph? Yeah. Remove edge H. Uh, wait, so let me, I don't know what these things are here. So you say remove edge H. Well, I think if I remove H, the graph is no longer connected, but I, I can still make a cycle, right? Because I can still go like this. 
if there exists any cycle that starts and ends at the same vertex, then the graph is still cyclic, right? So what, somebody want to give me a couple other changes I make? Yeah. Remove all the edges. Remove all the edges. <laughs> I like the way you think, sir. That is a correct answer. Um, can anyone make a less invasive change to the graph? Yeah. Sure, you can remove more than one edge, yeah. Remove C, D, and F. C, D, F. So it's kind of hard to read it, but like this one's still there. This one's still there. This one's still there. This one's still there. And this one's still there. Is that what you want? Yeah, that looks right to me. Looks about right. Um, I guess one, one heuristic would be if you count the vertexes and count the edges, the number of those should be, you know, what? what how many vertexes we got? Six? And how many edges you got? Five? It just seems like that's the right number to connect them without any cycles here. Yeah. So, I mean, your answer was fine. It might have been that I should have asked something more specific. Maybe I should say, can you make it be acyclic but still connected, right? So then his answer would be the right one. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, some graphs have self-cycles where the graph has an edge that goes to itself, like, uh, like this, like an edge like that. It's called a loop. Most of the graphs we're going to use in our examples don't have that. Certain data sets, it just really doesn't make any sense. I mean, like if you're doing airline flights, can you imagine if you bought a flight from SFO to SFO? <laughs> <laughs> like you just go up and spin around in the air and then you land or something. That would be, doesn't make any sense, right? Nobody would want to buy that flight. As good as the airline food is, you wouldn't want to buy that flight. Um, so that, that data set, it doesn't make sense. But sometimes you can do that. Like uh, some social networks allow you to friend yourself and stuff. You know, there's, you can send a message to yourself on a chat program sometimes. I don't know. Sometimes it makes sense, but mostly we won't have that in our data. Okay, so those are cycles. And again, like I'm going to kind of use these terms. I might say, hey, let's look for an algorithm that searches for so and so in a in a graph, and you can assume the graph is acyclic. And you know, sometimes that's kind of how I'm going to use these terms as we go forward. So let's talk about some variations of graphs that you're going to see. One variation is what's called a weighted graph. That means that the edges have uh, numeric weight or cost attached to them. So, uh, you know, again, it depends on the data set, but like if you're doing flights or, or driving directions, a pretty simple way to weight the edges would be, well, the, the weight is the number of miles of the plane flight. So if I'm trying to find a path from, you know, SFO to Miami or whatever, then maybe I want the one with the lower weights because it's less miles, fewer miles that I have to fly, right? There's other ways you could weight the edges that wouldn't necessarily be the, the distance. Like, I, I want to be a little careful not to over, over uh, make this about um, uh, physical distances, you know? Like, graphs are not always about physical space and uh, walking around on a map or something like that. Because I think it'd be tempting to say, oh, the, the, the weight of the edge is like how long the edge is. But I think you want to detach from that a little. For example, another way you could choose to weight this graph would be you could weight the edges by how expensive the plane ticket is to fly between those cities. And suddenly, now you're trying to maybe optimize the cheapest. Uh, I know we got, you know, parents weekend and you guys sometimes fly home to visit them and stuff. Sometimes you're sorting and you want the cheapest one. And even though that cheapest one has an extra layover in, in Denver or whatever, you still buy that one, right? So, so like that would be a different way you could have weighted the same graph, okay? And look, I'll tell you, we're going to learn algorithms that search for paths, and we can search for paths that optimize certain properties. You can optimize the length, the number of edges. You can also optimize the total weight of the path. And so that's an example of that here. Um, most weights are uh, assumed to be non-negative. It's not necessarily a hard rule, but like in a lot of data sets, it wouldn't make sense to have a negative weight. Like they don't pay you to take a plane flight, uh, or if it's mileage, there's no flight that's negative miles. There's no wormholes here, right? So uh, the weights are all assumed to be positive in general. If you want to think about equivalence of graphs, you could think of an unweighted graph as being one where all the edges have an equal weight of one or something like that. Okay. There's another variation of graphs called a directed graph. Directed graph is one where the edges only go one way. So like the, the examples I showed you previously, it was assumed you could travel either direction on the edge. But a directed graph has these little arrowheads and basically we're saying, no, no, that edge only goes from A to B, not from B back to A. So what are some examples of that? Well, you were telling me about prerequisites. 
that might be an example where you want directions because 106A is a prereq for 106B. 106B isn't a prereq for 106A. The order, the direction of that relationship matters, right? You don't want to take those classes in the wrong order. If any of y'all have signed up for 106A next quarter, you messed up. You'd get the arrow wrong on your edge, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, another example of that would be Twitter, right? Like uh, I can follow Jennifer Lawrence, arrow from me to her. Last I checked, she has not followed me back despite numerous messages from me, but we'll see. I'll check again today, twice. But, um, you know, the directionality matters because I'm going to see her tweets. She doesn't give a shit about my tweets, so. Uh, directionality matters sometimes, right? Might matter sometimes in a road or not. You have one-way streets, you have two-way streets, right? So it depends what the data set is. On Facebook, if we become friends with each other, we're just both friends, both directions. I can't be your friend without you being my friend. Twitter's different that way, so it depends what the data set is about. It depends what the graph is modeling, right? Uh, I also want to mention all these different combinations, all these different uh, properties of graphs can be in combination. You can have a weighted directed graph or an unweighted cyclic undirected. You know, you can have all the different combinations of these different qualities in, in a graph, depending on what you're doing. Okay? How are we doing so far? Do you guys have any graph questions so far? I gotta tell you, I, I, I really wanted to come in. I, I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna get my wife to help me. I'm gonna make a video of me holding up my baby with the Lion King you know, uh, music you know, in the background. And I really wanted to like, have that for you guys today, but next Friday, I'll bring that. <laughs> That's what I'll show you next Friday uh, to make up for my uh, other, other lecture quality. But um, anyway, stay tuned. Anyway, okay, so, so these are some general things about graphs. I think this is mostly just conceptual stuff. I'm going to show you some code with graphs in a minute here. Um, one thing I want to point out is that graphs are actually pretty connected to the other types of data structures that we've learned about. We learned about linked lists. We learned about binary trees. Those are basically graphs that have a bunch of extra constraints placed upon them. A linked list is one where you have every, uh, it's, it's a directed graph. Every vertex has at most one outbound edge. They're directed edges. And there's a root that, or a front that has no inbound edges, and a, a last final node that has no outbound edges. So it's kind of a, a graph with certain constraints upon it. Binary tree, same thing. You can have at most two outbound edges. There, there's some additional constraints about how you can't have two paths that lead to the same destination, and so on. But these are these are subsets of graphs. So that's kind of interesting, right? Okay. So let's look at like how would you actually code with a graph? What, what does that look like? Um, we have a library for programming with graphs. It's called the Basic Graph class. It's part of our Stanford Collection Library that we provide to you guys in the homework uh, startup zip files that we give you. It's called Basic Graph. It represents a weighted directed graph. So you can have edges that go one way, and if you want to put weights on them, you can. So uh, it's, it's not that complicated to get started with. You just include the library in your program. You can construct a graph, and then you can add vertexes and edges to it. Um, you know, some of these methods, like if you try to add the same vertex twice, it gives you an error. If you try to add an edge between vertexes that don't exist, you get an error, that kind of thing. And it's directed, like if you say add an edge from C to D, the arrow goes from C to D, not, not both directed. If you want it to go both ways, you can do what I've done here with C and B. You can add an edge from B to C and from C to B. Then you basically, it's kind of like having a, a one directional edge that goes both ways. So that's kind of how to get started with basic graph. Here are some of the methods, the members that the basic graph library has. You can add edges and vertexes, you can clear, you can ask for all the vertexes or edges as a set so that you can loop over them. You can ask for all the neighbors of a vertex and it'll tell you all the ones you can hop to or, or, or reach from that vertex. You can just remove things, edges, you can ask for the size, you can print the graph out. So pretty standard stuff, maps you know, between uh, vertexes and their neighbors. So that's what it does. Um, I want to do a little programming problem with you guys just so we can like play with this library for a second and get familiar with it, okay? So um, uh, I don't think I need to show you this slide yet. Let me, come, let me come back to that slide real quick. I'll come back to that. So uh, I want to write something called coolest where I will read a file full of Twitter followers and then I will figure out who has the most followers of followers. And so the lines of this file each have two tokens on them, each have two uh, words or names or whatever, and if it says name one, name two, that means that the person number one is following the person number two. 
Okay? So I want to output the person who has the most followers of followers looking in at them. Does that make sense? So here I am in Qt Creator. I want to write this coolest function. I'll take in the file as a parameter. And so down here, I want to write this with you guys. All right? Um, maybe I can help a little get started because, you know, some of this is just about reading a file. So um, if, if you want to see the file, it looks something like this, uh, twitter.txt, just a bunch of names. This means Stuart follows Marty and Helen follows Elmer and so on, right? So if I want to read those, those lines, I think I could do something like this, um, string line while uh, get line from the input into this line variable. Uh, actually, you know what? The, the, there's just two tokens per, um, per line. So I think I can just do string name one, name two, and I think I can just do input uh, arrow name one and then also arrow name two. That just reads two words, two tokens, and it'll give me a false if it's not able to do that. So I'm reading two names. What do I want to do with those names? Somebody help me out. And I want to, I want to do it with a graph. <laughs> so. so if the graph doesn't already contain the names, you should add like a node with that name. OK, so uh, you said if the graph doesn't contain the names, I should add the nodes with that name. So I think implicit in your comment is that there should be a graph. Right, so let's make a basic graph called graph. And then I can just do graph.add vertex name one and name two. Uh, I forget, let's double check. What does it do if you call add vertex and the vertex already exists? Um, if the given name is already present, does nothing. Okay, so <clears throat> we can just add them. If they're already there, it'll be fine. And then what else? Put an edge between those two people. Okay, graph, add edge from name one to name two, like that. If you want to see if you got the right graph, you can just say see out graph and all, and just see if it works. Looks pretty good. I've got a graph full of names here. It's a little hard to read, but basically it prints all the vertexes first, then it prints each edge with a little arrow. So I think that matches the file. So we got a graph, we got data in the graph. Okay. How do I figure out who has the most followers of followers? What if it was just followers? How do I figure out who has the most followers? How do I know that? Yeah. The degree, like the number of neighbors that you have is the number of followers you have. Yeah, one thing I want to point out, like, if you want to know how many followers a person has, so let's say this is Jennifer Lawrence right there, and this is me, Marty, right here. And I'm like, oh yeah, so I follow like that, right? That's what our graph is going to store. So if you want to know how many neighbors uh, J-Law has, you know, there is a method called get neighbors, um, but get neighbors is going to tell you how many outbound edges there are, how many people she is following. You know what I mean? And so, uh, I think the problem that we're running into is I don't want to know how many neighbors a vertex has in this system because that's how many people that person follows. I want to know how many people are following them. You know what I mean? So what do we do? How do we reconcile that? Do you have any thoughts? Yes, yes. Um, this is a great way to get around this. Basically, let's just make the edges store the other way. I know intuitively you think of it as like, I follow you, so the edge should go that way. But look, the graph is only useful for solving whatever problem we're trying to solve. And the problem we're trying to solve is about who follows me. So for me to know that, I want to be able to reach my followers. You know what I mean? So I kind of want the edge to go from me to my follower, which is the order I have highlighted that you suggested right here. So now it really is uh, J-Law has an edge to me because I follow her platonically. Um, 
So, okay, so if I want to know how many, let's just say how many followers does the person have? I think you kind of answered that. You said, so if you want to like loop over the vertexes in the graph, you can say uh, graph dot get vertex. There's a couple of um, methods. There's one called get vertex names that'll return a set of all the strings of all the names of the vertexes. There's another one called get vertex set that returns a bunch of pointers to the more information about the vertexes. I'm gonna use this get names for a second. So if you wanna loop over them, string v vertex in that, if I wanna know how many followers they have, that would just be graph dot get neighbors of v dot size. That would be like how many followers that they have. But, <clears throat> I don't want to know just how many followers they have. I want to know how many followers of followers that they have, right? So how do I do that? Where, what, how is the graph storing that follower of follower? Yeah. Sure, basically for each of the neighbors, let's ask how many neighbors they have, right? So let's do something like um, for each neighbor in graph.getNeighborNames of V. So we're looping over all the immediate followers now. I want to know about the neighbors' followers. So I could say graph.getNeighbors of... Uh, of this neighbor, and I could do dot size of that. One thing would, that would, could come up is I could have duplicates, I could have overlap here, so I could solve that by throwing things into a set or something like that. This will be fine with me. So basically I just want something like int followers of followers equals zero, and then here I'll do followers of followers plus equals that, okay? So for everybody who's following me, I'll ask who follows them, I'll count those all up, I'll add up all those counters. That's my followers of followers, got it? And what I want is who has the most followers of followers. So that's basically just a max uh, computation, you know, int max followers of followers is zero. Once I'm finished computing a given person's followers of followers, I just do something like, you know, if this person's followers of followers is greater than the max I've seen, then the max equals this, right? Um, but the ultimate goal of the function is that I'm supposed to return the name of the coolest person, the name of the person who has the most followers of followers. So I think in addition to storing this max, I should store their name. So like string coolest person equals I don't know who, whatever, and then if this person is the max I've ever seen, then coolest should become V, this person who I'm looking at right now. Okay, when I'm done I'll return the coolest person. And coolest person in this graph is Maron. <laughs> Seriously, like all my data sets are just like very not so subtle kissing up to my boss hoping that he'll give me a bonus or a raise or something. Maron's the coolest person ever. <laughs> Parents, uh, Maron Sahami is the boss of the, uh, the lecturers here in the computer science department. So anyway, uh, you can look through the data later to verify that that's the right answer. Um, if you have a little trouble seeing what it's doing, I'd say download the code and put some print statements in to watch the different loops go through. But look, the point of that exercise is that I just wanted to kind of use this library a little bit and uh, see how it works. You know, it's a nice little library. I will say, you know, it would have been possible for us to solve this problem without this library. You know, using the collections we learned before, we could have used maps and sets and like, we could have totally done this without the graph, right? So I'm not saying like, look at this, it opens up a whole new world of problem solving or whatever. I just, I'm just showing you like, this is an example of using this library and there are gonna be some problems we're gonna learn to solve that this will be uniquely well suited to solving. So that's kind of the goal here, right? You guys have any questions about this code here that we wrote? Okay, well, uh, let's look at a little more stuff here. I'm gonna start teaching you about looking for paths in a graph. So that's here. I'm gonna show you two algorithms that are fairly simple-ish, and as we go along, we'll learn more complicated ones. And I think you'll see that there's benefits to each of these algorithms. So when you search for a path, sometimes you just wanna know if one place is reachable from another place. I'm driving, can I get to the goal that I wanna reach today? 
sometimes you want to maximize or minimize something. I want the shortest path with the fewest hops. I want, the, I want a direct flight, nonstop flight. Sometimes you want the lowest weight. I want the cheapest flights. I want the fewest miles, this kind of thing. So you know, different algorithms look for different things. Um, this example here, the shortest path from Miami to SFO, I think, involves flying to Honolulu. But that is not the minimum cost path because of the mileage and the, and the pricing and so on. So you can optimize for different things, depending on what's important to you. So OK, let's learn some path searching algorithms. One of them is called depth first search, DFS. This means you um, start at a given vertex. You're looking for a path to a destination vertex. And the way that you do that is that you try one path. You sort of have different edges, different neighbors, different ways that you could go. You choose one of them, and you follow it as far as you can, and you see if it leads you to the destination. And if so, you stop. Otherwise, you come back and try a different one. Does that general style of algorithm sound at all familiar to you? You try something and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, you try something different. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> I love you guys. I missed you. I miss all 17 of you who come to lecture. Um, <laughs> by the way, parents, your kid does not come to my class most of the time. They came for put on a show for you, but there's some new faces here I haven't seen before. <laughs> it's usually like me and these four folks and these two guys right here. That's it. It's just us. We just like hug and talk about computers together. Um, anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, this is like recursion and backtracking that we learned several weeks ago. Choose, try something, explore it, and then if it doesn't work, unchoose. That's, this is a recursive algorithm that's often done with backtracking. So if you're searching for a path in this graph from A to H, maybe A, you try going to B. And then from B, you try going to E. From E, you try going to F. From F, you try going to C. From C, you try going to I. You, know, you still didn't find H, so you sort of back up, back up, back up. And uh, there aren't any other ways to go along that tree of choices. So you back all the way up to A, you try going to D. D leads to G, G leads to H. I found it. I'm done. I'll stop. You go, wait a minute. Don't go to G. I need to go to D to H. That's a better way. This algorithm doesn't think about that. It doesn't try to find the best path, the shortest path, the minimum weight path. It just tries to see if it can find a path. And if it does, it gives you the path. Depth first search. That's what it is. So here's a pseudocode for how to write this. I mean, honestly, I probably didn't even have to show you the pseudocode because you've done so much recursion and backtracking, I bet you could kind of figure this out if you had to. Basically, DFS from V1 to V2, you sort of mark down that you have visited V1. You know how to mark stuff. You mark boggle squares and, you know, you mark things so you don't visit the same square twice, right? So you mark it somehow. Then you recursively do a depth first search from each neighbor, seeing if the neighbor will lead to V2. And if so, you stop. Otherwise, you unchoose and try the next neighbor. OK? This pseudocode is a little high level. It's, it's not very detailed exactly each detail that you have to do. <laughs> That's because I'm going to make you write this code. But this is the idea of it, right? Choose, explore, unchoose each neighbor until you find a goal. Now, usually when you're doing this, the end goal is that you want to find a path and then you want to have the path. Give it to me. Give me a vector of the vertexes I should visit. You know, give me the answer out as some kind of data structure, right? So if you want to do this and store the path, then you guys know how to do that. You've done backtracking algorithms where you pass along a vector or something that you, of all the choices that you have made, right? Just you do that here. You just pass along a path parameter. And then as you visit each vertex, you add it to the path that you're building. And then if you find the destination, ta-da, there's the path in your little vector. So you guys have done that a bunch of times already. So I know you have, have skills to, to write code like that. If you don't find the answer, then you unchoose, you remove the ver vertex from the path and try something else, right? This algorithm talks about marking things as being visited. And I don't really say how to do that. How would you do that if you just had to go write something like this? How would you mark a vertex that you visited it before? You got our basic graph library, you know. Any ideas? What do you think? Make our own struct or something. Just like call it better graph. Has a He's like, let's write our own better graph. <laughs> what are you saying? I wrote basic graph. You want to write a better graph? Fine. Come on up here. Uh, no, no. Um, so keep some kind of Boolean track of that. Um, OK, where do I put all these Booleans at, though? I think you're mostly giving me what I want a little bit more. Like, where do I, 
how do I remember this information? Who's been visited? Who's been marked? All that kind of stuff. Keep your hand up. You could use, uh, you said chosen vector. I would say that there's kind of a path vector of what we've chosen. So you could use a collection and store information in it. I would say rather than a vector, maybe something more like a set or a map or like this vertex. Did I visit it? Yes or no? So either a map of vertexes to Boolean values or maybe just a set of vertexes that you have visited before. When you visit a vertex, put it in set. When you are done, you maybe remove it from the set. Yeah. mark the graph by editing the content on the vertex, you could do that. A lot of algorithms avoid that because they don't want to accidentally mess up the graph. But yeah, you could do that too. Like some of you probably did that in, uh, in Boggle. Like as you visited a Boggle square, you like changed the letter to some other letter to, as a breadcrumb to yourself to let you know that you, uh, you did it before. Yeah. So okay, that's, stuff like that would be how you would mark a vertex as visited. So that's depth first search. I'll tell you, depth first search is a nice algorithm because it's simple to talk about, simple to describe. It's not that hard to implement. You guys will implement it later. Um, the drawback, I hope, that's clear is that uh, it doesn't find the like, best path by any particular measure. It doesn't find the shortest path necessarily. It doesn't find the lowest weight path necessarily. It might by accident find that, but it's not guaranteed to do so. So that's a drawback. So yeah, it's, it's guaranteed that if there is a path, it will find one. And it's pretty easy to like, find the path as a vector and emit the path to somebody who wants to look at it. Those are good things but it's not optimal. It doesn't return the shortest or most lowest weight path. Okay, one more algorithm. I'm doing these ones fast. I'm not spending a lot of time on them because I kind of want to save some of that for you guys later next week. Um, the next one we're going to do, just a few minutes left, is called breadth first search. This one, I mean, look, the names should tell you what they do. Depth first search goes deep. Let me try going that way as far as I can and see if I get there or not. If not, I'll come back. Breadth first search is the opposite. Let's move a little bit in each direction. Let's move out to my neighbors and see if I find the goal. If I don't, let's move out to all of their neighbors and see if I find a goal. If not, let's move out to all their neighbors and see if I find a goal. You see, it's an iterative deepening of a search. The best thing about breadth-first search is it's guaranteed to find the shortest path, the fewest edges. If, if it finds a path, it will find the shortest one. That's great. Where have we done an algorithm that we were searching for a path between two things and we wanted the shortest one? in the word ladder, homework assignment. I tricked you. You thought you were doing wax on, wax off. You were writing bread first search. You were learning some karate and stuff in that homework too. That was an example of a bread first search. You guys are searching for a path where you turn one word into another word by changing a letter at a time. You guys used a bunch of stacks and cues and data structures to implement that algorithm. You were implementing a bread first search. Take the word out, find all the neighbors of the word by looping around changing one letter. Neighbors, right, you guys did that. Take all the neighbors and put them on a stack and put them in the queue. You implemented this idea in homework two. Just didn't know that it was called that, maybe. So here's what you would find if you did a bread first search from A to I. You'd first look at the immediate neighbors of A, B, D, and E. None of those are I. So you'd look at their immediate neighbors, all the neighbors of D, all the neighbors of E. Eventually, you'd look for the neighbors of the neighbors, and one of them would eventually lead you to I. So that's the shortest path from, uh, from A to I. How do you implement this thing? Well, again, I'm only going to show you a pretty short pseudocode, but it's not actually that different than your word ladder code. You make a queue, queue, remember, word ladder, queue, of vertexes to visit, initially storing only the starting vertex. And then you have a loop that pulls a vertex off the queue and adds all of its neighbors. <coughs> word ladder, word ladder, word ladder. <laughs> Pull the front thing off the queue, add all of its neighbors back into the queue. It's not stacks, it's just individual vertexes. And eventually, if you mark the destination vertex as being visited, you found the target. So that's it. Um, I'm out of time, so I have to stop there. But uh, thanks for being here, parents and students. Have a great parents weekend, and uh, I'll see everybody on Monday. Thanks.